Welcome to season two, episode eight of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. My name is Dr. Kurt Megu, and I'm the Public Relations Officer of the United National Congress, the official opposition party in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a unique venture streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States. We speak with people from around the world, trying to understand different issues and problems relevant to my own country, Trinidad and Tobago, but also to people in sometimes very similar and sometimes very different situations, cultures, histories, politics, sociology, etc. The goal is to learn from each other, to build networks, to widen our perspectives, and to work for solutions in our distinctive contexts. Today's episode is entitled Hurricane Katrina, Ebola, Muslimin Coup d'Etat, Coping with National Emergencies Before COVID and After. For the past 18 months, the world has been dealing with a global pandemic that has caused an unprecedented global shutdown of economic and social activity. Although this has been an international emergency in which the whole world has had to face, each country has had to face it nationally in its own way, with its own resources and capabilities. Some countries have had experience with national disasters of various types in the past, natural, political, economic, military. Now is a good time to reflect upon how countries have dealt with these national emergencies in the past and how have these past emergencies compared to the current COVID crisis, and what lessons can be learned from these past experiences. Today, we look at the national emergencies which gained international atten attention, the 2005 Hurricane Katrina in the United States, the 2014 to 16 Ebola crisis in West Africa, and the 1990 Jamaat al muslimin coup, coup d'etat in Trinidad and Tobago. We are privileged to be joined by Ron Millington from the United States and Dr. Bo Tawari from Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Kurt. Thanks for having me too, Kurt. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, just a brief, I'll give a brief introduction and ask you to expand uh, um, later. Ron Millington served in the US Armed Forces where he received the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal and a former Department of Homeland Security Tactical Law Enforcement Officer. He was involved in FEMA's Hurricane Katrina relief efforts and also managing the Ebola crisis in West Africa. He also had experience with the um, Deepwater Horizon uh, incident in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Dr. Boendradat Tawari is a distinguished academic educator and politician in Trinidad and Tobago. He was a former cabinet minister in two administrations, including in 1990, when a small radicalized group of insurgents took over Trinidad and Tobago's parliament for six days, held MPs and the prime minister hostage, putting the entire country in a state of chaos and uncertainty. So welcome again. Um, so that's it for my introduction and, and the rest would be uh, having you all to, to share your experiences and for us to learn lessons from it. And I want to start off by, by asking you, you know, to give our audience, our global audience, you know, a, bit of, a bit more of your background than what I gave there. And in particular, how you got involved in, let's say on Ron's case, Hurricane Katrina, Ebola, Deepwater Harbor even, and, and in um, uh, Bo's case, uh, you know, how uh, um, you got involved in politics and, and the, the 1990 coup and how, how that came up, I, I mean, uh, suddenly. We, we, we'll get to that, uh, I guess, Ron and then Bo first. I mean, uh, Ron first and Bo after, sorry. Sure, no problem. Well, thanks again for having me on the show. Uh, well, currently I work as a geopolitical consultant in the areas of security and strategic planning. Uh, I joined the U.S. Armed Forces in 2002. It's been a it's been a while. 2002. Uh, I served in the U.S. government for about 13 years, but I have over 15 years of background in emergency management, human trafficking, drug intervention, drug interdiction, uh, and for the past few years, I've been focused a lot of my efforts, as you guys 
might know or not know on philanthropy, public service, and I sit on the boards of a few nonprofits. Uh, Hurricane Katrina. At that time, I was uh, serving in the US Coast Guard when Katrina hit. Katrina was a category five. It was one of the uh, largest natural disasters the US has ever faced at that time. Uh, we learned a lot from Katrina, put it that way. How I got involved in Katrina is that I was already serving in the US Coast Guard and we were deployed after the levees broke. And, th and this was before, because I know also, we're, we're not gonna expand on this in this program, but you also yes. were dealing with the Middle East and, and terrorist, uh, anti-terrorism. Yes, in the East. yes. So, so prior to that. Yeah, so prior to Hurricane Katrina, uh, I was working in the Middle East as a private contractor with uh, various agencies and institutions. Uh, did a lot of projects in the Middle East, uh, West Africa, mm -hmm. quarantining with Ebola, yeah. uh, and also a lot of anti-terrorism and logistic operations in, in, in North Africa. Right, right. But Ebola was tough because it was in a war zone. Okay. So, hence the reason Boko why Boko Haram I, was around at the time or not? Boko Haram was, but they were in Nigeria. And yes, right. Ebola was in Nigeria. Uh, and it was bad in Nigeria, but not the effects that it had in West Africa. Okay. But yes, you are correct. If you're leading on to that entire area being an area of conflict, correct. Okay. All right. You so, it's kind of a, a dual crisis there as well. So, yes. So, that's, yes. so that's interesting. That was part of your military deployment. I mean, that, I mean, that that gives a whole different phrase to the to, to the phrase state of emergency yeah when you have doctors security personnel u.n personnel ministers of government dealing with a pandemic and also a war zone yeah wow it, it puts things in perspective yeah yeah and i'm bo um i mean well ron you know trained for this in the military uh, you didn't have, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, you didn't have such training to deal with the insurgents that came in 1990. Uh, you have a very interesting background. Uh, why don't you give our audience a, a bit of your yeah. background and the NAR and then the crew and maybe how prepared or unprepared personally you were, because that administration you were part of itself was a kind of revolution. Uh, so that, I think all that's interesting and it would be interesting for our audience. Yeah, well as you hinted, my, I've really sort of, my life has been divided into you know, what you might call two vocations. One is education and teaching and learning. And I eventually ended up in administration and leadership positions in education. Um, so I've had very, very varied experiences there and uh, functioned at a pretty high level. And then... As yeah, you were principal of the University of the West Indies, the that's, the West the West Indies. that's right. And I got into politics very early when I came back from my first stint at graduate school at the University of Chicago. I came back to Trinidad and I became involved with Tapia. And Tapia... My involvement with Tapia and the intellectual work there, but also the political work uh, for, helped to facilitate the process of the creation of the NAR. And we, the NAR eventually, which brought together the opposition forces in the country, which was the umbrella that brought together the opposition forces from Tobago, Central Trinidad, the rest of the country. Um, and, and just to interject here, and, uh, and this was, you displaced a government that had been in power for 30 years, for 30 even years. before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, we had a consecutive run by the government that had um, come into power as the first party government the People's National Movement, and they stayed in power under Eric Williams mm -hmm. for 25 years, almost, and another five with your chambers. And uh, the NAR was able to dislodge them for the first time in a sweep mm -hmm. because it was a united uh, force and 
So that took my career into parliament, into government, uh, and eventually into opposition. And now I have sort of exited the political scene and basically um, moving in a different direction. But I remain intellectually interested in all of these issues. And uh, the NAR, got, we had a situation in which the, I have to say the 19, 1990 was an attempted coup because it did yeah. not succeed. They held parliamentarians hostage. They blew up the um, police headquarters, uh, but they, they did not uh, take over the government as such. All right, the coup did not succeed. And you asked about preparation. Um, I don't think that the country was prepared for it, but there are a few stories I have to tell, which um, you, this is more of an introduction, so I won't get to them yet. Uh, there are a few stories I have to tell, which indicated that there were things that were going on. For instance, I was minister of industry and I got a call on my telephone at my desk and it was Robert Amar calling from uh, Rome airport in Italy. And he indicated to me that he saw uh, um, Yastu, uh, uh, Yasin Abu Bakr together with 17 other members of his group uh, in the Rome airport taking a flight to Libya. And I immediately contacted the prime minister after his conversation and the prime minister called the then minister of national security and asked me to come to the prime minister's office. And I relayed what I had heard from Robert Amar. And um, how, I how then, many days after, was this in relation to the coup? No, no, this, this, this was years before. This was years like, before. OK, OK. It, it was like um, this was perhaps 19. No, it wasn't years before, actually. It was months before. Right. It was months before July, yeah. uh, because it was, in fact, in 1990 that he called. And um, so after we had a short conversation, I left the prime minister and the minister of national security, and I went back about my business. And perhaps... Uh, some months before, maybe in 1989, because I was not yet Minister of Industry, I was in the Prime Minister's office as a minister without portfolio in the Prime Minister's office. And Jean de Benet, who was then ambassador to Fran of France in Trinidad and Tobago, and with whom I got along well, had indicated to me that the French government was very concerned, of course, the French have interest in the Caribbean, yeah. was very concerned about what was happening and the role that Abu Bakr was playing at the time in the Caribbean. And I think they had some information that either he or some of his people had traveled to Martinique and had met with people there regarded as uh, maybe inimical to the interests of the French government. And she relayed that to me. And I arranged a meeting with Robinson uh, for her. I did not attend that meeting. I told uh, the prime minister then uh, what she had said. And I suggested that he meet with her. And he did meet with her. And they talked. And the prime minister and I then talked afterwards uh, after the meeting. Not the same day, but uh, um, some days later. Uh, so that was done. And when the coup, when the attempted coup did happen, when they stormed the parliament, I was not in Trinidad. Uh, I was in Hong Kong at the time. I had gone on a, on a trip in the Far East with a number of businessmen from Trinidad. And the way, the way I learned about the coup in Hong Kong was that 6 a.m. Uh, uh, in Hong Kong, which was 6 p.m. Trinidad and Tobago time, 
yeah. when the coup was taking place, Arthur Lockjack came to the door because he had been a member of my mission and he knocked on the door of the hotel room like crazy, frantically. And when I opened the door, of course, I'd woken up from sleep. He said, Bo, go in Trinidad, go in Trinidad. Did uh, Abu Bakr and them uh, just uh, stormed the parliament. And I don't know anything more. Um, and he had just gotten a phone call and it was then difficult to call back Trinidad. Right. And uh, that is how I learned about it in Hong Kong at that time. Yeah. And that's very, I mean, poignant with you. Now you're saying that with what has gone on in Haiti recently where people, um, you know, stormed yeah. the house of, of, of the Haitian prime minister. And of course our condolences uh, go out to the um, family of the you know the Haitian president and the Haitian people um but yeah yeah I, I you know and that th th there's so much uh you know to to talk about that that coup and that time because you know I, that that, that, that displacement yeah uh -huh. I want to ask uh Dr. Bo a question uh so you gave this information uh to the government what did they do uh how did they react when you presented this information prior to the coup well, one of the things I followed up with, uh, with the Minister of National Security and, um, and the Prime Minister at the time was that I asked them if they could, I asked the Minister of National Security whether he would find out when they were coming back and then track them when they came to Trinidad. And it turned out from the information provided by the then Minister of National Security, who was Selwyn Richardson. Um, he indicated that they had traced, they, that Abu Bakr and his company had flown from Venezuela to Rome and then from Rome to Libya. Um, and when they came back, I think the Minister of National Security did arrange with the police service to trace this matter. But of course, I was not involved in those things. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> but I don't know what happened with the trace and how close it was and how seriously they took it at the time. Well, the, the only reason why I'm asking, because uh, I know this show is on emergency management and I wanted to know when you gave this information, did the government make any preventative steps knowing the information that you gave them? Because you said well, earlier in the program that they weren't too prepared when this took place. I mean, I, well, I, 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 I yeah, go both. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I would say that it's clear that intelligence was weak because right. I got that information because of my relationship with Robert Amar, who happened yeah. to Correct. be in Rome at the time. Correct. And nobody knew about it, right? They only found out later how these people had done. The police did not know. The intelligence service within the police service did not know. Um, and I got the information from Jean de Bonnet, who would have tracked sources that had to do with the government of France. Yeah. And the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago would have gotten it to her, from her. And they would have then followed up with our intelligence services. So I would say at the very minimum in terms of lack of preparation, the intelligence services in Trinidad and Tobago was extremely weak at the time. Yeah. I mean, and ju just to interject, fair assessment. I, it, um, the the whole country was, was unprepared. I mean, it, it was really a kind of a loss of innocence when Abu Bakr took over the television station. We only had one television station in the country at that time. Uh, it was state owned. We didn't have a liberalized yeah. media, and he went on and announced the coup. People thought it was a play. They didn't. They didn't realize that it was actually true. They thought it was some sort of drama, some sort of. Uh, it 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 was really. Uh, uh, nobody expected this. It it, it came. Yeah, it was just so much out of the blue. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm sure when you got the knock on the doorbell at at six a.m. in the morning. It, I, I you wouldn't have taken. I I think you would have been in a state of disbelief. You can't be serious. That's happening in Trinidad. 
I, I, am I right or, or what? T tell me I, how you felt. I I was surprised. Um, I, I I really was surprised. I was taken aback. But the but the the connections of the people in the coup were very um were were very well organized and internationally connected mm -hmm. because the morning the, the 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 day before the morning that I was awakened by Arthur Lockjack and given this news of what was happening to Trinidad, I had met with two businessmen from the United States in Hong Kong who had discussed with me the possibility of making an investment in Trinidad related to garment manufacturing. That was the nature of the discussion. Other things too, but that was their principal first interest. And I had talked to them, uh, you, might, you might say innocently and in good faith about a business proposition. But ironically, on that morning when Arthur Lockjack came into my room and we started to talk, about 6.25, there was a knock on the door and one of those businessmen came there uh, to, to continue the conversation, he said. And well, I was alarmed. So I took a walk to the bedroom and I asked Arthur if he would come afterwards. And when he came in, I told him, I'm very suspicious of this. And I think that we should get the police immediately. And by that time, we had called the honorary council in Hong Kong. And he showed up in a jiffy. I don't know where he was, but he got there very quickly. And once he was aware of what was happening, he got in touch with the police and so on. And that fellow disappeared uh, from the room. And, I, and when I was sent, when I took the decision, when I took the decision immediately, I was supposed to go to mainland China that morning. I took the decision immediately that I was going back to Trinidad. And I got a flight uh, that they arranged for me from Hong Kong to Los Angeles. And to my amazement, I was, I was sent there under basically under police supervision and received by uh, police and national security uh, authorities at the airport in Los Angeles right. and put in a special room by myself uh, for security purposes hmm. with a guard outside the door. And at one point in time, a woman walked into that room. I don't know how she got in. And she said, you are the minister from Trinidad. And I screamed, I yelled, and the guards came and they took her away. And up to today, I do not know what transpired. Who's this that. lady? Who's this lady that I came in the room? I have no idea. Wow, wow. And this happened but where? In, in LAX in America? In, that's right, in Los Angeles. So somebody in Hong Kong was connected with the people in the coup. And somebody in Los Angeles was either connected with the people in Hong Kong or the people in Trinidad and Tobago related to the coup and had knowledge of it. I don't think she came there to do me any harm, but I think she came there to perhaps assess the situation and what was happening. Because, I mean, obviously, if you are attempting a coup and you've got all the members of parliament under lockdown, and you got the television station under your control, and there were ministers outside, you would want to keep them outside and not get them home. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair now, assessment. So, the, so that that's that, that's a fascinating situation. We could spend the whole now, hour speaking now, of that. It, when it's the, amazing. When the, when the report on the on the coup was being prepared, I got a letter from the commission asking me if I would testify. I was prepared to tell them all of these things. 
Yeah. And I told them, yes, I would be more than happy to testify. But they never called me to testify. Oh. And I didn't, think, I didn't think it was my business to force my way into the committee to testify. But right. I've told this story before. I have gone over the story. Oh, there is, well, I mean, I'll tell you another story having to do with Rafiq Shah. Um, but um, I have gone through some of these stories with the people that I mentioned in order to verify in my mind that what I was saying was in fact accurate. Yeah. And they had similar memories of it. Uh, it might have differed a little bit on occasion, but yes, they were aware of those kinds of issues. Mm. Right. So, so if, if, we, if we take it back in terms of, of, of lessons on, on what to do and so forth, obviously the, the government of Trinidad was, was unprepared uh, for it. Uh, and for dealing with this, uh, and but uh, and, and, uh, but but I I want to uh, t take it uh, to to you, Ron, because we have the most powerful country in the world, the United States, and Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I mean, at least from us looking on the outside, it looked like a mess and disaster as well. It was, and then, and it then was. you also had uh, your experience with Ebola in West Africa, so so it would be interesting to hear from you about you know how. Uh, how similar or how different was the experience um, in the most powerful country in the world dealing with, with that crisis, which was, I suppose, unprecedented in terms of natural disaster. It was unprecedented. And then in, in West Africa, uh, what were the similarities, the differences uh, in, in national preparation that you found? Okay. For natural disasters, there really isn't much preparation that you can do. You have to be prepared prior. Uh, emergency services have to be up and going. You have to have a stable healthcare system. So you're asking about comparison of both. You really can't compare either because yeah. you answered it, one of the most powerful countries in the world and you compare it to a developing nation. Uh, did we have lessons learned? Yes. Was everything perfect? No. Uh, we had logistical issues. Uh, with Hurricane well, Katrina, if, there was if I just interject for, for you to expand on, I mean, everybody remembers the famous uh, telethon where Kanye West burst yes, out. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so you can uh, incorporate that in your uh, discussion. Okay, I wanted to stay away from that, but yeah, that, 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 I mean, that's politics. <laughs> yeah. uh, when, when politics are involved in a, uh, a national event or a national emergency, just put it this way, it makes it harder for the government response. Yeah. Because the media could either make your job easier or the media could make your job harder. Because yeah. at the time of a national response, this is not the time to be taking political sides. The, the, the time of action and needs, you need to address and put your resources on the floor quickly because the constituents, they need it. And yes, uh, we had a slow response time in Hurricane Katrina. Right. I won't sit here and lie to you and tell you that everything was perfect. Where were you based? Okay, so it was considered at that time sector New Orleans where the US Coast Guard ran mm -hmm. operations, but of course it was flooded and we had issues. So they moved. But, but, but were you generally operating. working around that area? or did Yes, you have working to come around that area. Us. Okay. Yeah, we were working in an adjacent state. Right. Uh, flooding poses a whole different problem when you're talking about getting resources on the ground because people are trapped in homes, mass casualties, mm -hmm. people are displaced. The law enforcement apparatus that normally would gain law and order is no longer there. Yeah. They're at homes tending to the, they're at home tending to their family and to their loved ones. So it's the government and the people are depending on the government. So as quick as we can get out there and put resources on the ground is as quick as we can get the job done. And that was one of the, needless to say in my experience, it was probably one of the most toughest events I've ever been on. Right, right. Yes. So, so now if you compare that to um, you know, West Africa, your experience with, with the Ebola crisis there, um, you, you, you said- No you, comparison. You said in, in, let me tell you yeah. why. I, I look at everything in numbers. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, I think the death toll was 1,833. Okay? Of what? What's that? Uh, Total casualties. Casualties. I mean, 
Yes, yes. The number of people killed by by the total number, right? Right. Ebola was upwards of 28,000 lives lost. Lost? Your deaths? Lost. You're talking yes. About? No, I, I, her I, fault, 11,000 lives lost. It was 28,000 people infected. Okay. Right? Oh, wow. I didn't yeah, let me get the numbers that. correct. 11,000 lives lost, about 28,000. Okay. And, and these are the only numbers that we know. Because you remember, yeah. West Africa has a lot of rural areas, and we have a lot yeah. of issues getting proper statistics out of these. Um, yeah, I know Nigeria hasn't done a census in decades. Correct. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. So when you're talking about comparison, I compare in a number of fatalities because, I mean, it matters. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A national disaster in relation to a pandemic. Yeah. Excuse me? In terms of the preparedness of of the government. So what what, what countries did you deal with? Ghana, Nigeria? Well, I I dealt, personally, I dealt with Congo and Liberia. Congo and Liberia. Okay. Yes. Because at that time, Boko Haram had it was a big issue in Nigeria. Nigeria, Nigeria was dealing with a whole nother set of yeah. issues within and political issues within their country. And uh, we were uh, contracted to do West Africa and the Congo because they had right. quarantining issues, which was which was crazy. Crazy. What, to say what the were the issues? What were they? I mean, now the whole world knows about quarantine. <laughs> okay. And, what were their issues? At the time, we were still learning about Ebola. Ebola had been out for a while. And how you handled the dead was very important. Because we found out with Ebola that the dead was more infectious than a live host. And, and how, how you handled the remains affected how we treated people in the area, how we treated burials. Etc. 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 Setting up new protocols, whether you bury the dead, whether you burn the dead, every area section that we were at, every country dealt with it differently. It was right. it was a mess, and we had a lot of international agencies. We had Doctors Without Borders. We had the United Nations, uh, uh, American military. Uh, I was with a group of expats that were volunteering our services okay. to provide then, security, logistics. Yeah. Let, let me get back to, to Bo on this. Now, what, one of the interesting things was that, so when the parliament, so the police station was blown up, the parliament, uh, the, the, um, uh, the single uh, radio station and TV station were taken over in the parliament, the prime minister and the ministers were, were held hostage in the parliament. So it seemed like they had everything covered. But as you said, you were in Hong Kong and there were many ministers who were outside. And in fact, uh, so you you had the situation for the six days where you had the government ministers and the prime minister inside. And then you had yourself and other ministers outside um, dealing uh, with the crisis. And I, I, I don't know exactly what your role was in in that but uh you know what what was it, it it like what was your experience what was it like um you know in in terms of trying to to get the the resolution in place and and, and deal with that well first of all i try to get home as fast as possible and i was home on the monday i think um together with the commissioner of police whom I met in Barbados uh, because he was coming um, from, I I might have been from New York as well. I had traveled from Los Angeles to New York. Uh, I had met our um, ambassador to the United Nations there. That was Marjorie Thorpe. And the next morning I flew down to Barbados, and I think either later in the day or the next morning, I flew with the commissioner of police to Trinidad and Tobago. And then I went up to the, the, immediately, I simply went home to see my family and make sure that they were safe. And I went immediately to the Hilton where they had basically set up camp. And I got in touch with the other ministers that were there. And um, and I became part of the group that tried to 
basically, I mean, there were two critical issues. One was to, to secure the release of the hostages. Uh, the second one was to keep the government uh, going even while the hostage situation was taking place. And the third thing was to keep the country calm in an in a almost impossible situation where you had most of the government inside the parliament on the hostage. Um, and uh, and the, you know, you had had some looting and so on before. And the, the question of order was very precarious. But um, the, 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 I want to tell you a little story about the, mm -hmm. the release of the hostages and how that happened. Um, while we were doing all of the, the main negotiator during the time of the hostage crisis with the um, Abu Bakr and his team was Joseph Theodore, who was Brigadier General at the time. And he was doing all the talking with the hostages. And um, the, the, they were on the, the side, other side of the telephone was on various occasions, um, Abu Bakr and Bilal Abdullah by and large. Uh, I don't know if there were other persons, but those were the names that I heard mentioned. And at one point, Rafiq Shah called me and he said to me, look, I don't know who to talk to in this thing, but I am going to talk to you and tell you what is happening and you have to find a way of doing something about it. And he said that Bilal Abdullah had called him and indicated to him that Robinson with the shot in his leg mm. and being a diabetic, they were afraid that he would die in the parliament. Yeah. And that he wanted the exit of Robinson from the parliament and to medical attention as quickly as possible. Now, I didn't hear this conversation with Bilal Abdullah. This is something being reported to me by Rafiq Shah, who report, who received the call. I, I, I think I, I want you to expand on something here, especially for our international audience, because I think it's unusual internationally. So here you have these insurgents, these coup leaders who blew up the parliament to taking hostage, uh, and yet they are concerned about losing the life of the prime minister. Uh, how, 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 how do you see that and how do well, you explain that? Well, because they, they were, uh, I think um, on reflection now, I, I didn't know what was going on then, but on reflection, I think they wanted to remove Robinson as prime minister and to change the government and the direction of the government. And they wanted an influence on the governmental apparatus. So for instance, one of the things they asked Theodore for, because I was in the room at, with him at the time, because when I heard this, I want to say quite frankly, I was very cautious about it. And I went to Theodore directly. And I told him what Rafiq Shah had just said to me. And I, I guess he had his way of either talking to Shah or verifying it or whatever it is. And he asked me if I would stay with him in the room during the negotiations. And one of the things that Abu Bakr was asking for was to have 45 men of his men precepted and to have them issued firearms and for them to be, uh, to, to play a role in the, what essentially would be the post Robinson government. Because remember they had sent something asking that uh, he be replaced by Dukaran. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and Pandey and Manning that, would be part of it. He would be national security minister, these sorts yes, of things. Yes, all of yeah. these kinds of things. So, and, and 
Theodore went through that process. I mean, he was the calmest person I ever saw. I mean, I must say, eventually he got a medal for it on behalf of the of the um, the military. Very well deserved. Um, but uh, he was the calmest person in the world, and he managed the situation. And eventually, he managed the release of Robinson, and then his transference to the hospital. Uh, he went to St. Clair Medical, I think, because I went to see him afterwards. And he managed the surrender of Abu Bakr and company. Mm -hmm. And they were then taken to Shagar Amas in that makeshift, whatever makeshift prison that they had over there that kept them isolated in that part of the country under the control of the army, I believe, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but I think those things are important to understand that Robinson could have died in there. Other, uh, or other people had been brutalized. Mm -hmm. uh, Selwyn Richardson had been badly brutalized. Yeah. And, and, um, and one of he died. And Leo Devines. Yes. Uh, um, Leo Devines, I mean, with whom I have a real good relationship, actually died out of the yeah. coup because he was shot. And the um, former finance minister, um, Selby Wilson, was yeah. also terribly brutalized as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, but eventually, I mean, Robinson was released and the hostages were released and the hostage takers basically surrendered. And that is how that part of it came, into a, came to an end and the government was able to continue to to function, but it was a very, very dicey time. And I certainly was in a situation where I did not know who to trust. Mm -hmm. I did not know what was happening. And I was very, very cautious about what I said to whom. And um, I had complete faith and trust in Theodore, I want, I want to say. And he, I, I proved to be right on that. And he, he did what was required in order to bring the situation under control. Wow, wow. Okay. Now, for, for both, um, so let, let me get back to Ron now. Uh, particularly, I mean, well, much of the world is opening up, but in Trinidad and Tobago, unfortunately, it's, it's the reverse. Uh, you know, we, we are in the sort of worst phase of the crisis, a state of emergency, a lockdown. And, um, uh, but let, let's say the, the Ebola crisis, how, how was that revol uh, resolved? You know, because Right now, during COVID, you know, people are trying to see where, where is the end of this, you know, uh, so about okay, so so, e e Ebola, how, how was that resolved? And, and I guess maybe you could also reflect on Hurricane right. Katrina, if anything, but okay. Ebola, I think, is very relevant to us now with the COVID issue. Okay. You can't live in fear of the virus. Okay. You, you can only do lockdown for X amount of time, but you have to understand what lockdown means. Lockdown means you're hurting your country's economy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully during lockdown, you are also ramping up the capacity of your law enforcement apparatus and your healthcare system. So you ask, how do you get over those hurdles? Those hurdles are dealt with management and leadership. Uh, I think Mr. Tuari would be a better person to ask on how well he thinks the government has been handling that aspect of logistics in the country, but, but, uh, but because it, I'm not there. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of uh, Ebola and, and West Africa, the, was it just- um, the, the world uh, threw resources at it. You, you understand the world yeah. threw resources at it because it, th there's a big difference between Ebola and COVID. Yeah. Uh, Ebola kills its host quickly. Yeah. All right, within a matter of days, you ha it's, I mean, it's, you have a mortality rate of what, 90%? Yeah, uh, it's a yeah. COVID, it's, it's I think, ridiculous it's like number. two percent or one point right. something percent, but Ebola so, is like yeah. So with with high mortality rates, it's really hard for an infectious disease to spread worldwide because the host shows symptoms quickly, so you're able to quarantine that individual more rapidly. COVID is a whole different ballgame. You can be asymptomatic with COVID and walk around and infect other individuals. 
So dealing with those two situations are totally different because the disease attacks the host differently. So, so did, did the disease, I mean, they, they don't have a vaccine or anything for, for that. So did, did the disease die out and then that's how it was? Or was it like- Management, they decided, management, yeah. management, management, right. uh, management, uh, quarantining zones. Right. You have to understand those are war-torn areas. So their healthcare system, it's broken. Yeah. It was broken prior to the epidemic. And of course, the strain of the epidemic it's probably one of the reasons coming back to Trinidad and Tobago, why the country was initially put on lockdown right. is the strain that it would have on the healthcare system. If COVID got out of control, yeah. tell me uh, if I'm wrong. I, I right. want to ask you in terms of both in West Africa and the, the United States with hurricane Katrina, what outstanding issues do you think remain like, okay, the, the crisis ended, but uh, bureaucracy, solved, have, just... bureaucracy, bureaucracy, yeah. And Hurricane Katrina, it took us too long to move an object from point A to point B. Yeah. And, For instance, and, and those issues are still there? Those problems those, are still there? I mean, there? the bigger the government is, the more bureaucracy you, you will have. Yeah. Okay. And, and bureaucracy hinders efficiency. Right. Okay. The more people you have to ask to get a job done, knowing that it needs to get done, hinders your ability to help. Right. When you need authorization and authorization yes. and authorization, yeah. Because people ask, uh, what was the U.S.'s capacity in helping people with natural disasters? We have a great capacity. The U.S. has an awesome capacity of, of, of deploying resources. But to actually get those resources on the ground is where the problem is. Right. And we continue to have that issue. And that issue is not just... Re relevant or prevalent in the United States. It's, I've seen it throughout the world. I've seen it in Trinidad and Tobago. I've seen it in Latin America. I've seen it all throughout the world. Government bureaucracy is what hinders all responses. Right, right. So let me ask um, you, Bo. Uh, I mean, what, uh, you know, so the crisis was resolved as you described, um, yeah. but what outstanding issues do you think uh, remain in, in your opinion? I, I, I think a lot of outstanding issues persist, you know, yeah. at, the, at the time, I think the, 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 remember we had an acting president because the president at the time was out of the country. So that in itself created a problematic situation. Vacuum and leadership. Uh, secondly, secondly, you had an issue of the, the amnesty and its validity, its legitimacy, uh, its legality, and subsequently the role of the court in that. Yeah. And the, the decisions of the court created a, conditions in which, created a condition in which citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, regardless of what you think, what you believe, or how you relate to the political and constitutional apparatus, they basically saw that people could literally commit murder, take all your governmental officials hostage, blow up a police station and get away with it. Yeah, because they're still walking free today. Kirk, I want to ask, I, what has changed since then, uh, Mr. Tawari? And well, well, I want to continue with this. And I want to say that that could not be good psychologically. Yeah for the attitude towards justice and fairness and right and wrong and mm -hmm. the role of the law in any society or system. Correct. So I feel that a lot of things that we are suffering from now, that we are managing now, that we are handling now. Cause and effect. Has its genesis or certainly the escalation of what we are experiencing today from those consequential decisions following the attempted coup. And secondly, and I think this is a point I really want to make because I had a conversation with criminologist Randy C. Passard the other day on television, and it reinforced in my mind the importance of this, which is that 
the relationship in the Caribbean, whether it is in Jamaica, whether it is in Trinidad and Tobago, whether it is in Kits or where, between political parties and governments and their alliances and relationships for political purposes with criminals and criminal elements with the capacity for subversion in the society. Yeah. And the consequential inevitable compromise of the police system, the prison system, and the judicial system in that society. And I think that when you are talking about small societies like St. Kitts, like Jamaica, like Trinidad and Tobago, and even smaller societies, I think the, those kinds of things, I think we underestimate the long-term deep damage and the persistent risk to the society of those kinds of relationships. And I think that really, we still have to address the question of how we create different conditions than what attend now in our societies. Because I think we know certainly in the case of Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica, that that relationship between criminal elements and political elements does exist and that the compromise of the critical elements of law enforcement, prison enforcement, and judicial enforcement does exist. And I think that that is a serious matter. How do we fix the, that? The stability and sustainability, we need another program for that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. That, yeah. that is a serious, serious matter. And we don't, do not want to face these issues as a society, and we do not want to in, engage them intellectually, morally, legally, um, and ethically in the context of a societal and social construct that is for the, the social good, the welfare of all, um, and Unless, uh, unless we deal with that, we, we, are, we are going to be work, constantly working in what is essentially a kind of quagmire. And um, we have to face it and the truth of it, or else I think that it, the situation will simply move from one point of escalation to another, and the hole will get deeper and deeper until one day we can't get out of it. Yeah, yeah, those, those I, I have to agree with you. And, and you know, those are very, very powerful observations. I, now, it, now, let me tell you something. In, in terms of the COVID issue that, that we're, we're going through and to try to bring it to the current day and lessons. Sure, and, to the COVID, I mean, yeah. My, my thing, my, my belief is that what you all are talking about, the experiences are far more severe than, than the COVID crisis. Although, you know... The, the, the reaction to the, to, to the COVID crisis was massive. The shutdown of the entire global economy, that, that's never happened before and, and, and so forth. I, 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 I believe it, it really has been an overreaction. That, that's Do you think it was a knee-jerk reaction? But uh, well, I, I, what, what, what I want to get, get from you is, is from your experience in these, in these other crises, what you think, um, what your opinion is in terms of looking at how the COVID crisis has been dealt with compared to your previous experiences. And then also, you know, you would have, have, have learned lessons from your experience and, and, and have they been applied to now? Are they relevant? I don't know. They, they might, they might not be relevant. And, and uh, you know, do you have any sort of insights from your experience on, on, on the COVID, on the handling of COVID uh, right now. So I'll ask Ron and then uh, Bo after. Like I said, like I was saying earlier, only time could really tell whether these lockdowns worked or didn't work. 
We don't have enough data. Remember, everything is coming in real time. Right now, COVID is brand new. So I don't want to make a, uh, a, a statement that won't be valid later because we we're, we're getting new data as times come in. Uh, the handling of COVID. You want to know about the world handling of COVID or Trinidad and Tobago specifically or the United States? Um, the United States, uh, where, where you have more experience. Well, I mean, here's the issue that I have with the handling of COVID. Certain countries handled it as in federally, and some countries handle it locally. And the United States, it was a little bit of both. They let a lot of the states make the decision, but yet the CDC had oversight. It was quite murky in, at times of how they gave out guidelines. It's brand new. It was lessons to be learned all around. Uh, only time could really tell how well the United States handled the disease. Uh, I wouldn't want to make any uh, statements right now. It's still pretty early. Okay. Uh, all right. Lockdowns. Yeah. The one thing I could say about lockdowns is uh, at times I, were, I wasn't for lockdowns. I think lockdowns actually hurt cities, countries, and individuals more than it helped. And in certain countries, the way that they did lockdowns actually caused more spreader events. Yeah. All right? Closing down of banks, closing down of stores, then you open them up for certain days or certain time frames, and you have massive lines and people standing outside for hours. The exact thing in which you didn't want to do is exactly what you did. And I, I saw a lot of indecision and indecisiveness from many agencies in many countries and many governments. Right, so right. I think there's a lot of lessons learned around the world. And Bo, how, how about yourself in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the lessons that, that you would have learned well, from your crew experience, well, I, I, whether it's relevant it's, at all? I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that globally, uh, COVID uh, met a situation of mismanagement of risk. Because, you know, people like Nicholas Taleb and so on, uh, and others after, had in fact foreseen the possibility of something. And I mean, literally foreseen. They had warned about it without yep. knowing the, without knowing the, the medical facts about the possibility of a germ like this, a virus like this. And secondly, this had been publicly signaled by people like President Obama. It had been publicly signaled by, by people like Bill Gates. And nevertheless, when it came, the whole world was unprepared for it. So I think we need to acknowledge that there was a colossal global mismanagement of risk. And we need to understand that and take it for what it's worth and then move from there. Fair enough. The second thing, the second thing is that the, the problem that we had with this was that we were trying to manage a health crisis to avoid, avoid contagion and massive deaths, death tolls as indeed uh, we tried to do with the situation of Ebola, except that that was better contained geographically, but with equally devastating effects. In fact, more devastating effects in the places in which it occurred. Um, and we, yes, we tried to do that, but we realized very quickly that you also had to create the conditions or situation for people to live. And therefore, the, 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 the issue between lives and livelihoods came out as a choice. But really, the choice is really lives with livelihoods. How do you do that? That's a fine that line. Huh? That's a fine line because you risk people's safety by that, right. That's right. And that is so you are faced with another situation in the reality, not in the prognosis, not in the contemplation of what could happen, but in the reality of what is happening, of how do you manage the risk 
of lives with livelihoods. And I think that is the quandary in which we found ourselves. And that is what tested the decision-making process. And some have made good decisions and some have made bad decisions. And we don't know yet, I agree with Ron on this, because there is the mutations that are taking place, the variations that are taking place, and we don't know where that is going to take us ultimately. Correct. I think, I think we are going to get to a situation where we will say, we have to have lives with livelihoods and do our best notwithstanding whatever happens with the virus, because we have spent nearly two years uh, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, nearly 15 months locking down and unlocking and locking down again and so on. And pretty soon people are going to have to say that you're going to have to live with it. And that also, we don't know what is going to happen. And yes. I really don't, I don't think that we can at this point even hint at a possible answer as a solution to the problem. It's a, it really is an experience that we've never had before. And we are living the experience and trying to manage the experience. And the experience is changing as we continue. And we will have to see where it leads. I don't know. I really don't know. Right, well, I we've reached the, the hour mark. It's been a fascinating discussion. But, but what I, I'd just like you to, to just briefly, with, with a sort of one line, give your insight, give a, a, a final word to our audience uh, before you go. Um, Ron and then Bo. Ron, quickly. Uh, final word to the audience. Uh, hopefully, whatever country you live in, since this is into an international audience, that your government has a post-COVID plan for recovery. Okay. And Bo? Well, I will just give a quote from William Faulkner when he gave his Nobel Prize speech. And he said very simply that man will not only endure, he will prevail, meaning human beings. And crises will come, uh, risks will emerge, we will manage them, we wouldn't manage them. But I think ultimately, in spite of all the crises we have, I think that we will, uh, we, we, we will endure and we will prevail as a human race, notwithstanding all the mistakes that we make. All right. Well, thanks very much, uh, both of you. It's been a really fascinating and interesting discussion. It's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Ron, you must connect with me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 100%. Trinidad 6858612. Yes. I'll give him the number. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Let him get a WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. So Good. that's it for this week's episode of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof podcast formula. We were talking with our guests Ron Millington from the United States and Dr. Boendradat Tiwari from Trinidad and Tobago on Hurricane Katrina, Ebola, Muslimin coup d'etat, coping with national emergencies before COVID and after. And I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for watching and listening. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, follow, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. If you're watching on YouTube, please also click the bell icon so you get notifications of when our programs are uploaded. Thanks again, and see you next week. Thank you for inviting me, Cook. Thank you for having me.